G'day, Paul from Small Crown Productions here. Welcome back to the channel. In this video, we're talking with Henry Walker, who is an expert in Elizabethan fencing, and he is telling us about the types of swords that we might commonly find in Shakespeare's day. Let's go. Okay, so to my left, um, we have two military swords, and to my right, we have two civilian swords. Um, really importantly, um, Contrary to popular belief, when firearms arrived, the sword did not disappear off the battlefield. The furthest one to the left is a long sword. This is a knightly sword sort of battle. Came from all the way from the uh, medieval period and before, and travelled all the way through, and probably went th came through to the 17th century, even even a little bit further on. Um, this one is what's known as a Mary Rose Claymore. The Claymore that we all know, which is associated more with the um, Highland Scots, actually started as an English weapon, and this is a copy of the same sort of hilt. Um, moving to my right, we have two civilian weapons. We have what I call my civilian sword. This is the weapon that is a was the sort of turning point between the military sword and it's a civilian sword. It's got a bit of the same sort of cutting power. It's also sh slightly shorter, slightly heavier than our well-known civilian rapier, which is long, thin, primarily used with the point. Common elements amongst all of the weapons, but you'll use the long sword because it shows them perfectly, are pommel, handle, quillions, blade. The quillions are designed to protect the hand. They really do do that job wonderfully. Um, the wep opponent's weapon slides down, uh, slides down the blade, and it it literally catches your opponent's opponent's weapon, preventing your hand from being cut. Obviously, this is an effort of last resort for the quillions. You should actually be parrying, uh, defending yourself properly with the blade. Um, not rather than catching your opponent's weapon on the quillions. There's quite a bit more bar work on these these weapons as compared to the ones over this side. These are military weapons, which means primarily you'd be armoured, primarily designed for cutting, as you can tell by the broad blade. The bar work on this one is designed for protecting a semi-armoured hand. So you'd have a gauntlet which extended from essentially above the wrist. This is so, and it's designed to protect against cuts and that sort of thing. Um, whereas the rapier has a lot more bar work on it and is designed to protect a civilian hand. We're talking about a person who's wearing a glove on their hand, which is simply made of leather. So the bar work is designed on a on the civilian weapon is designed to protect a civilian unarmored fleshy, sort of squishy sort of hand. I mean, and this is the reason why you start seeing these sort of plates on, on later weapons. Um, first, the first thing that started on these weapons was this particular bar here, the finger ring, when they started putting their finger over the quillion to get and gain more control over the point. These ones have, as you can see, have nice broad blades. As you can see, nice broad blades, plenty of cutting edge. Um, so with these ones, you use a grip, which is what I call what is called a hammer grip. You pick it up like a hammer. Um, it's be because you want to hit things. Use use the edge primarily for cutting. You don't need particularly much control over the point. Oh no, civilian weapon, rapier is the generic term people use. Um, you want to put your finger over the quillion to gain more control over the point. What this resulted in is this part of the blade, known as the ricasso, was blunted so that people could actually wrap their finger around it. This gained you more control over the point because they found the point thrust was substantially more effective, especially, especially with a weapon of this length and longer. Our good friend over here on the wall is 47 inches long and you do not want to try to be cutting with that in a nice close alley. Offhand devices we have before us are Unlike sport fencing where you're limited to, 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 to just the weapon you're carrying in your primary hand, the rapier had companions. You have the buckler which is a small shield, 
which as you can see came in plain forms or the slightly more complex form which had rings or a spike on the front now this spike most people think the spike is for striking people with it's actually not it's actually more effective for controlling your opponent's weapon the rings themselves um, with the sharp weapon i.e. one without a blunt the blade would slip underneath these rings and with a simple snap of your wrist you could snap the, your opponent's point off in this case the the plate is actually turned forward so that the point will actually so when the when the contact when the point hits it actually slides inward so gaining you actually more control and of course then you have the dagger for the offhand now daggers were a common thing people carry these on the belt all the time this one is specifically designed for use in the offhand for fencing with hence the plate across the front these were used in the left hand for as a companion weapon to the rapier used in close you could obviously strike your opponent with the dagger as well they're also cloaks and the rotella which is the large round shield behind it or even two swords if you are trained well enough to use them two swords means twice the trouble <laughs> big thanks to henry for taking the time to talk to us about elizabethan fencing if you would like to learn more there is a link in the description to henry's blog and also the first book that he's published it would be great if you could like and subscribe to the channel and of course i'll see you on the next video